Genesis 39, we've kind of read through it a little bit before, and I'm going to read through it again. And then at the end, um, there's eight things in this text that I think we need to talk about, eight little footprints, footsteps, that can really help us deal with temptation. And I think the story of Joseph and the story of uh, his um, time in Potiphar's house is really a good indication of really how we can stand our spiritual ground when faced with temptation. Genesis 39, um, I'll start reading from verse 1. I may not read through the entire chapter. This is a, a very familiar passage to us, but I'm, I'm hoping to put a little bit of a different twist on it this morning just for the sake of our talk and for the sake of our discussion. Chapter 39 of Genesis, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Uh, Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard brought him, um, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Remember, his brothers sold him into slavery and, and put him in a pit and took the, the coat, the cloak that he was wearing of many colors and, and dipped it in some blood and, and presumed him um, or pretended to the father that he was dead. So now he's been drawn out of that pit and now he's sold into slavery. The old preachers here used to say, you know, from the pit to the palace, God still takes care of us. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw uh, that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of all of his household and, and he had trusted um, to his care everything that he owned. From the time he put him in charge of the household to all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. You think that's possible? Is it possible to be such a good employee or work for a company or have such good favor that you are blessed not only because of your employment, but the whole company is blessed as well. You think that's possible? Is that possible? I believe it is. I do. I believe it is. Not to sound conceited um, or have your nose in the air, but I mean, as Christians, if we can't go into the workplace and have a positive influence on our company and see the blessings of God as a result of that, then we're not being salt and we're not being light. Joseph was well built, verse 7 says. Not only was he well built, he was handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. In fact, his rebuttal was, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Um, everything he owns, has, uh, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me, he says, except you. And because you are his wife. Joseph is trying to lay out his boundaries, and I, I think that's healthy. Um, even though in the midst of temptation, in the midst of things that we have to deal with, Joseph is still laying out his boundary, but we're going to see it in just a second. Just because you lay out your boundary, other people may not respect the boundaries that you have laid out. And I like the perspective here. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Um, the, the New Testament has a word for this, and it's really a steward. It's an old Anglo-Saxon word, but a steward is, is somebody who manages something or supervises something for that other person, for that employer. It's more than just a hired hand. 
it, it's, a, it's a position of trust. Um, and we always talk about being a good steward. We ought to really be um, a steward of God's resources for one purpose, and that is to bring an increase. So Joseph here, Joseph is the steward, and he knows it. And he's comfortable with that. He sees his responsibility and he lays out, look, here's my boundary. And I can't, there's no way in the world I can do this because the master has been too good to me. The only thing he's withheld from me is you. And the reason is because you are his wife. Now you would think, and yes, I'm going to have a little fun with this and you've been warned about my biblical sense of humor. You would think that would be the end of it. Um, but not so, not so. How then, the end of verse 9, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Wait a minute. I thought she was the one that came on to him first. Where'd God come into the picture? Just bringing some things up for us to think about. Maybe some things to talk about. He, he not only relegated this um, to the elevation that it was supposed to be between him and God, it was never about just him and her. It was never about that. Did I see your hand, Sister Pamela? You didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't, but if you notice, the evil thing he was saying he could not do, he never brought the master back in. It was oh. strictly between him and his relationship with God. And he knew that no matter what, it was going to be him no matter, what. no matter what. But now let's back up for a second. You're, you're on to something good. I, I think he's still a slave. He's still taken from his house into servitude, indentured servitude. And so now I don't see his attitude stinking. I mean, he's trying to make, to me, he's trying to make the best of this situation. He's gotten com not comfortable. He's at peace with the fact, okay, I'm transplanted and I'm here, but, but I still have my morals. I still have um, lines that I won't cross. Last time we talked, we call that integrity. He is a man. Joseph was a man demonstrating integrity. And see, that's the thing. You know, we, we, we think we have integrity, and somebody defined it like this. Integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's watching. I heard that definition. That definition kind of stuck with me. Um, because it's easy to do the right thing if Ernest and I are out together. It's easy for me to do the right thing when Ernest is there, but what happens when Ernest is not there? Am I going to do, do the right thing? So we see here, Joseph is a man of integrity. What else do you see here? What else jumps off the page at you before, we get, before it turns south and it's going to go south in a minute? What else impresses you about this young man, Joseph? Anything else? What else impresses you? I like the loyalty to the master. And ultimately to God, I think. But yes, very loyal to the master. He realizes, possibly, I'm just asking, do you think he realizes, you know, it could be a whole lot worse. <laughs> it, could, it, it could really be a whole lot worse. I ain't going to mess this up. Yes, I'm, I'm in servitude, but it still could be a whole lot worse. Could be. But he was still seeing throughout all this, God was still blessing him. He I was see that. When he, was, he was taken. So some of the training from his household, when he was a child, that he can remember, God was still part of him. Had to come with him. That's right. And so That's right. Had to come he, with him. He was in a circumstance not of his own choosing. He still saw how God was blessing him. Absolutely. And you never saw... Now, I, I wasn't there at the time, but it doesn't look like, hey, God's blessing me, so you better pick me. You better yeah. choose me. You better let me do because I'll make things. He still seems to have a hungry spirit. Okay. And that teaches us, even in, the, even in the worst of circumstances, if we keep our faith and our trust in God, God will bless us even though we think we're in the worst of circumstances. Go ahead, Mandy. And I won't get that. I won't get it. What's the, yeah, I wonder that's right. been with him though. It has to have been through the whole time. No matter how bad, no matter how, no matter how bad bad gets, God is still a recurring theme right. in the whole thing. And I've got to keep my attitude 
together. And that's the hard part, I think. That's, I mean, he could very easily, we could see a different mindset with this young man, you know? They took me from my home. My brothers did me wrong. I mean, we, he could have played the same song, fifth verse. But I think, I think this has given us a lesson in not only um, integrity, I think it's given us a, a, a good idea in, in our mental attitude. Just because you're in a bad situation, your body has to be there, but your mind doesn't. Just saying. Just saying. Go ahead, Mandy. Not to wallow. No, you're okay. Not to wallow in self-pity. Yeah. That's kind of tough to it's do, though. Tough. I mean, I look at all the stuff that I don't have or people that have done me wrong, and I'm like, mm, oh, woe is me, and, you know, I'm a good guy. Why do they do this to me? You know, it's pretty great to be Fred Fample. <laughs> Why do people bother me? But, you know, you've, we got to rise. we got to rise above that. What else? Anything else? So just because he set his boundaries does not mean that uh, she is going to respect those boundaries. Um, verse 9, nobody's in a greater position in the house than me. Verse 10, um, although <clears throat> and though she spoke to Joseph uh, day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. I can almost see in my mind's eye, he's going around doing his job, whatever he does in the house. Maybe he's peeping around the corner, and if she's in there, I'm going to go over here. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm, I don't think that's too far off. I don't. You know? And, but, you know, the law of averages catches you. Um, and every so often, you got to face your demons. Uh, verse number 10 um, he refused. Verse number 11, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties. I love the way it's written here. He went into the house not to do mischief. He was doing his job, okay? And uh, none of the household servants was inside. wonder if that was deliberate. I'm just asking. I'm just, we're raising questions. I've got my eight things here. I'll show you in a minute. But wonder if, if this thing went on, if this game of tag went on day by day. All of a sudden, now this one day comes, and all of a sudden, wait a minute, where, where's everybody at? <laughs> what if that was deliberate? Don't know. My guess is yes, but that's just a guess. So he comes in one day, and he's getting ready to do his job. None of the servants were inside. Twelve says she caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. 13, when she saw that he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house, she called her household servants. Wait a minute, I didn't think they were around anywhere. Maybe they weren't in the immediate area, but when she yelled out, maybe they, yes ma'am, what are you, what's going on? And again, I kind of think this was a setup. Just me. I, I kind of think this was a setup. This was, was smart. She said, up through the garden or something like that. Maybe. <laughs> Go out the side entrance. <laughs> still, they would be within yelling distance. They would be within earshot. You are right. I still think this was a setup. Look, she said, uh, I'm in 13, I think. Yes, verse 13. Um, look, she said to them, this Hebrew has uh, been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. You know, <laughs> y'all might not know this about me. I'm just going to tell you. <clears throat> I can tolerate a lot. I really can. Um, but there is one thing at my core that just sets me off. Don't lie to me. You can lie about me. That's your choice. I'm fine. Uh, you, that's you. But don't lie to me. And one of my three children <laughs> is cut from, cut from my same cloth. I mean, that has been, that is my line. That's my line in the sand. Okay? Don't lie to me. I told my children growing up, you know, don't, don't lie. Um, tell me the truth. I will not punish you for telling me the truth. Now, you may have to suffer some consequences before, because of your action, but as far as punishment for telling me the truth, not going to happen. But now, here this lady, Mrs. Potiphar, I'm going to give her a nickname. Um, she, she said that he came in to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me, and he ran out 
of the house. Verse 16, she kept the cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. The Hebrew slave that you brought to us, uh, you brought us, came in to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. This is my different twist. I want us to talk about this for a second because I've seen this and you have too. We've read this text a bazillion times, but I hope to put a different spin on it this morning. Here goes. Do you think he believed her? Do you think Mr. Potiphar believed Mrs. Potiphar? And I'm going to point out some circumstantial stuff. Again, I'm not trying to say this is the way it was. I want to flip this and give you another way of looking at it that might not be what you think. Okay? Do you think that Mr. Potiphar believed Mrs. Potiphar? Come on, Mandy. I think he had to. I don't think he did. I think he had to react like he did. Wow. he didn't really. Wow. Uh uh, Mandy, leave that girl alone. <laughs> you know, somebody has indicated that before. Another congregation that I was at, and we were talking about this lesson. Um, and somebody else indicated that, Mandy. Um, and I'll just tell you what, and she an was an older lady, and I'll just tell you what she said. She said, Brother Fambo, if it happened once, it's happened before. And I went, Mama, really? <laughs> M Mama Tilly, okay? M Mama, really? She said, I'm just saying. And ladies, y'all can get mad at me all you want. She's an older lady. Y'all can get mad at me all you want. She said, Brother Fowler, if it happened once, it's happened twice. Too well laid out. You think it was too, that the plan was too well thought of? Wow. Let's read a little more and let me give you, let me give you my two cents worth here in a minute. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. But the true intent, she wanted to get rid of him. Could be. It looks like it was. It's almost like a prejudice. Look at this. This, this Hebrew this that Hebrew he brought. Coming to make sport of, of us mm -hmm. and things. Mm -hmm. The true intent is more prejudice than anything else. Could be. It came across one way, but she didn't say things to make it. This 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 servant you had. You know, tried to have have sex with me. She made it about his culture and that he was coming to make make fun of their culture. Could be, could be, and that or that could have been the angle that she chose in this. I'm going to say diabolical because I can't think of a better word. That could have been the angle she chose to make it believable in this diabolical plot. I'm not saying it was. I'm saying it could have been. Okay, something came to me, and I've been to this text. A bazillion times this week, though, just kind of reading and thinking and thinking and reading. Let me let me let me show you some other circumstantial evidence, and you don't have to agree with me. Just just look for a second. But as soon, verse 18, as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me, and he ran out of the house. When his master heard the the story of his wife saying, "This is how your slave treated me," he burned with anger. Towards whom? <laughs> I'm just saying it does not say and I'm not stretching I hope I'm not if I am y'all tell me and I'm going to keep going anyway um, it, it does not say he burned with anger towards Joseph it's possible he burned with anger toward both of them it's possible. That, now, that's where I'm going, Jerry. Because I'm saying it, by inference, for many, many years, we look at this and we automatically jump on her side. I'm saying, let's back up. It could be a broader stroke than that. Go ahead. Well, he's lived with her. He's a middle-aged man. To have all this wealth that he's got, he's a middle-aged man, and he's lived with her for 20 or so years. He knows what, what kind of character she is and what, you know, and... Uh, and the anger toward Joseph would be just the fact that he's angry because this guy has, he's done unbelievable financial things for, for Potiphar. And he's angry because he knows he's going to have to keep face in the community. And that's a lot of it with the servants and the people. 
I mean, this kind, this kind of news, it spreads like wildfire. It's going to get out. Whoa, did you hear what happened at Potiphar's house he's yesterday? Embarrassed. <laughs> so he's got to get rid of Joseph, but he knows it, 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 in his heart that it, it's not true. And she didn't even have to have the coat. She just had to tell the story. But she kept the coat. And she hung it, not on a nail, but in my mind, she kept the coat and hung it on the nail till he came home. Right. I'm just saying. I mean, it, it, just to make, I'm saying here with a broader stroke, let's back up for a minute because Satan's crafty, okay? Satan's crafty. And let's just look. And I'm, I'm with Jerry on this one. It, it says that Potiphar got, Mr. Potiphar got angry. Could be at both. I can't believe now I'm in this situation. <laughs> Now I got to do something that I really don't want to do if I can extend this a little bit. But I got to do something because my reputation is now at stake. I'm just, I think that's where we, that's where we are. Go ahead, Tenjin. I didn't think of something until uh, he had said that, that this is, isn't my point. Um, since everything Joseph did for Potiphar was blessed and increased, now Potiphar don't have him out there working, so that increase might stop. It could represent it could represent business loss. But I was also thinking if Potiphar was so angry at Joseph the jailer would his attitude would have reflected some of that. But the jailer was kind. He got Joseph got favored in with him and he was kind to Joseph which tells me that Potiphar wasn't all that angry because if he had, then he would have probably more than likely, the way man thinks now, um, put him with the worst jail, put him further away where conditions were horrible, more horrible because you did this thing. But you don't get that indication. You don't, and that's my point. Look at verse 19. You don't get that indication. And I'm just saying, remember we, we kept reading in the beginning of this, the phrase I told you to commit to memory, but the Lord was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph. Look at 19, and let me, let me interject something else. When his master heard the story, he told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Guess where, if you, go, if you go to chapter 40 and verse 2 and 3, guess where the king's prisoner and, and that prison was? It was connected to Potiphar's house. Look over chapter 40, verse 2 and verse 3, and you'll see that, that really Jerry, the idea that you're bringing up, that I'm driving at, was more likely the case and scenario. I got to do something, okay? But this guy's been too good to me to, to because think about it. Rape of a, a official's wife, that was sure death. That was execution. There was no, okay, let's put him in jail and throw away the key. No, that, that would have been complete execution. But in this case, Potiphar probably worked it out to where there was some leniency because of the past relationship that he had and the good that he had done in the house. I guess I'm driving down the same road that, uh, that Jerry's driving. I think that anger was twofold. I cannot believe. <laughs> Woman, you got me <laughs> in this situation. I think it was twofold. Where I'm going with this and why I'm spending so much time, and I'll start giving you my eight things in the wrap up, because we read the Bible, and if we're not careful, we, we, we superimpose our, our culture and our way of thinking into things when I think it's good to take a step back. Even though this evidence, I'm going to call it circumstantial, more times than not, again, God is still orchestrating everything, but it may not have been as hard, cut, and dry <clears throat> as, we tend, as we tend to think. Okay? Let's read the rest of it, and then I'll give you my wrap-up. Uh, he burned with anger, uh, took him into the prison, put him in where the king's prison were working fine. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him and showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held um, in prison, and he, made, uh, and he was made responsible for all that was done. Wonder if Potiphar had to put in a good word with the, um, the prison guard, since the prison, and I believe this, the prison was um, connected to, to Potiphar's house. So the warden put him in charge 
of all those who are in prison, and he made it possible for all um, that was done. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything, um, it's in whatever he did. Notice how God can be with you in the palace. God can be with you in prison. I think the takeaway, the biggest takeaway from this, and I'll give you my, my eight in this, in this wrap up, the biggest takeaway is it's us. And no matter what circumstance we happen to fall into or what happens to us in life, our relationship with God should be paramount in everything that we do, not just reduced to, well, I'm a good person and I go to church when I can. No, I think it's deeper than that. I think the reason that Joseph was blessed and God was with him is because he had a positive mental attitude and he really kept his eyes focused on God no matter what. Let me, let me give you some takeaways when we talk about this. We talked about integrity, doing the right thing when nobody's watching. You know, um, we, we, we all know people that are, are, are of impeccable integrity. Are they perfect? No. No, they're not. But, but doing the right thing and known for doing the right thing. And I'm not just talking about returning some change to a cashier when the cashier has given you too much money. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that, though that does indicate um, integrity. I'm talking about being a person of integrity at the core. Um, again, one side of this um, that I thought about, you know, Joseph could have taken the chance and went ahead and complied with her wishes, and she still could have screamed and had him thrown in jail. I thought about that during this week, too. She could have, no, if he would have just given in, there was no guarantee that she was going to keep her mouth shut. So again, we see here all about integrity, doing the right thing when nobody else is watching. Um, no matter what we see um, from all of this, all of us are going to encounter temptation. And this was just one instance that temptation was something that really Joseph didn't do anything. He was tempted just because he was doing his job. Um, something that's designed to pull you off track. So that's my personal definition of a temptation. Something that's designed to, to, to get your loyalty um, where it doesn't need to be. What's your definition? If you had to define what temptation is, if you had to tell somebody what's a temptation, what would you tell them? What would you say? What's, what's a temptation in your own words? Something that's a temptation. I'm not talking about just eating milk chocolate versus dark chocolate because <laughs> you can overcome that. I'm a living witness. No, I'm just kidding. Something that's designed to pull you, to pull you away. In Joseph's narrative, he experiences major temptations. And this is just, we, we're retracing Joseph's life. He was tempted um, uh, to be upset and bitter at the circumstances of being sold into slavery. We just don't read that. In fact, Mandy has referenced, we actually read the opposite. When he and his brothers come back together again, he basically tells them, look, what you meant for evil, God works it out for his good. Almost a um, forgiveness clause. I hate to put it that way, but, but almost a forgiveness clause. Hey, I ain't mad. Well, I'm not holding any grudges towards you. What you intended for evil, God has worked out for good. Um, when he became successful in Potiphar's house, undoubtedly experienced temptation towards pride um, and independence from God. And that's one, of our, that's one of our human temptations. The better we do and the more we think it's about us, the more that we tend to kind of leave God and spirituality by the wayside. Go ahead, Ernest. I was going to answer your question about what is temptation. I guess one analogy could be is the, the beginning of the road to, to sin, the beginning yeah. of the path. Yeah. It's just where you start off and then all of a sudden it just accumulates to you walking down that path. I can see this in Genesis 3. Um, remember they saw the, the tree um, and it was, it was good for food and they desired to make one wise. You know, that, that's, to me that's the first temptation. The temptation wasn't exactly eating the fruit. The temptation was, okay, you're looking at this thing wrong. <laughs> you, you, you're really looking at this thing. And that's us. That's, 
Again, in Joseph's case, he refused to look at Mrs. Potiphar wrong. And then she kind of, as Mandy indicated, she kind of laid a trap for him. And, and see, now I'm, I'm going to be messed up all this week uh, again because the words are ringing in my ears. Um, this may not have been the first time. May, may not, may not have been the first time. And then he experienced the temptation of sexual temptation with uh, Mrs. Potiphar, um, which is major temptation in this narrative. So after being wrongly imprisoned, it's very possible that he was tempted towards hopelessness and despair. We never see it, but it's possible. He always kind of takes the, makes the best of, of whatever situation that he's in. But in all these temptations, God is faithful to provide ways for him to escape, and he does the same thing for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 um, and verse number 10, there is no uh, temptation common in man, but God is faithful, and God will always make a way to escape. Here's the big question. Let me give you my, my, my eight um, things in this, in this close. What principles can we learn about overcoming temptation from Joseph's response in this particular narrative. What are some things that we can learn, that we can take away when it comes to how we deal with temptation? Let me just give you a few of mine, and if yours are different, as you think of something, um, let me know. Number one, I think we're going to have to have our minds made up that we're going to submit to God's discipline instead of being bitter towards it, no matter what. we got to have our mind made up before we even get caught up or involved in temptation, our mind has to be made up. Lord, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what happens to me in life, no matter what you send me through, I already know you're not doing this um, deliberately to hurt me. So I'm going to keep my attitude focused on, okay, Lord, I'm having a hard time right now. What, what, what is it that I need to learn from this situation to make me better? For you, I think, I think number one, um, when we talk about temptation, we need to check our attitude. We really do. What is it that I think about this situation? And again, I went to First Corinthians chapter ten, verses uh, nine uh, and, and verse ten. We need to have our attitude right, even before hard times get here. That way, we'll always be able to see things right, and ultimately see. God right. So I think, number one, we need to have our attitude right before we even get there. Um, so that when the hard times do come, or the challenging times do come, then we can kind of back up. And, and I've had to do this over the course of my life. Sometimes it's been spot on. Sometimes I didn't do so well. But I've always tried to look at whatever circumstance I'm in and ask myself the question, okay, Lord, what, 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 am I need, what do I need to learn from this, I've told you about you know not putting oil in the car and, and ruining uh, an engine or two. Well, now I know, okay. And you may have learned it long before. God bless you. I didn't, but I know it now. You see, so we need to have our we need to have our attitude right before the hard times even come. You ever you ever known some people that their attitude is always negative, no matter what they're going through. I don't know why things so hard on me. God always uh, looked like God out to get me. And I, I have to correct people on that all the time. No, God's not out to get you. God loves you. Let's ask a different question. What did you do to cause whatever the situation that you're in right now? So I think, number one, we need to, we need to look at our attitude. I like this quote. It's been with me for a while, and I've used this in my, my life personally. It's our attitude not our aptitude that determines our altitude. How I'm looking at things and, and, and how I, if I'm, if I'm struggling financially, it used to be it wasn't like this, but if I'm struggling financially now, you know the first question I ask myself? Okay, where did I mess up? What did I do? Uh, did I spend too much money on this and not on this? Now, that's, that's where my attitude is now. It used to be many, many years ago it wasn't like that. But now I've grown up enough to ask myself, okay, let me check my stewardship. Let me check what I've done. Maybe when I bought those two truckloads of chocolate chip cookies, maybe that wasn't, a, that, Mandy, that might not have been a good purchase that month. Probably not. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. 
that may not have been a good thing for me. I probably should have paid the rent instead of buying those two truckloads of chocolate chip cookies. I'm just kidding. I'm really not. Go ahead, Jerry. Pretty I'll add another step to that. Where did I mess up, you know? But look to the future. Where can I do better? In Very good. Yes. How can I? Very good. How can I take whatever this is now as a learning experience? Um, um, a building block. That's past history. Now correct. What can I do in the future how how can we how can we course correct to to make this? That, but I know to do it. Well, like I said, I told you sometimes I do good and sometimes I don't. <laughs> I told you that. But but we tend to. I guess Jerry, what I'm saying is we tend to get stuck in that rut too much, and I, I don't. I think we need to catch ourselves and just like you say, water under the bridge. Let's see if we can if we can move future. forward. Let's see if we can move forward. Attitude determines uh, your altitude. Look at the second one. I think to conquer, conquer temptations, we've got to practice integrity in all areas of our lives. And that's a, that's a tough one, you know, because we tend to want to practice integrity when somebody is watching. But we ought to be people of integrity, especially as Christians. We ought to be people of integrity no matter what. And put that in every aspect uh, of our lives. I remember working at the university, and there were uh, several times we were talking about budgeting, and we were talking about shortfall, and we were talking about more, and going to my vice president, and I remember telling her, I said, look, I know y'all are going to cut the budget next year. Um, I've taken care of all the financial responsibilities. It's $40,000 still left, and it's the end of the budget year, and I'm not going to frivolously spend. And so I'm telling you right now, um, when you go to the finance committee, you look at IT, we're going to have a $40,000 surplus. And I would really like it if you didn't ding my budget negative $40,000 next year. Because the, the plan was, y'all know this, in, in, in that type of situation, it's a spend it or lose it, use it or lose it. And so I just decided one year, look, we took care of all our responsibilities. Other departments were just spending frivolously just to get it to zero. Well, I, that's not right. I mean, that's wasteful. So I just went to her and I told her, I said, listen, you're going to see about a 40K left over. And uh, I, I'm not going to spend it frivolously. Um, but I would really like it if you don't subtract $40,000 from my next year's budget. You know what she did? She increased it by 40000 I had an extra forty on top of what I already had. She increased it. Well, good thing she did because next year I had to buy new computers uh, for some faculty members that I didn't budget. Okay. She didn't really increase it. She just moved it forward. I think so, but Jerry, she's not supposed to do that. At no. the end of the year, I mean, y'all know how it works. You know how the budget stuff works. You you get you, if you don't use what you have been given, that's a a, a ding to higher ups. Oh well, you don't need as much, and so they subtract it. In, in years past, I just decided, I'm going to be honest, and I'm going to just tell her, here's what happened. We didn't spend as much. I was able to cut a couple corners, and we got it done for this less. But please don't cut my budget for next year. And, you know, Jerry, it worked out. Thank God, because I had to buy computers for faculty members. I had like four or five new faculty members that next year. And ordinarily, you would have had to go and ask for an allotment. I didn't have to do that. She said, oh, it's, it's in your budget. I didn't take it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Person of integrity. Now, I'm not saying people that were spendthrifts were not people of integrity. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm saying I chose not to do that. For me and my department, that was wasteful. And I just wasn't going to do it. And I just told her the truth, and, and it all worked out. We need to be people of integrity and practice integrity in every aspect of our lives. Um, to conquer temptation, we've got to especially guard ourselves. And this one, I, I put this down. I couldn't think of a better way of writing this. Um, we, we've got to guard ourselves, especially during times of success. And here's where I'm going, and I'll, I won't get a chance to finish all this today. But do you think that we're tempted more during times of success than any other time? Do y'all believe that? I was struggling with this this week. When, when I'm more successful, Am I tempted more? Go ahead, Mandy. I think we let our guard down because life is smooth. I don't think we think that, may, that, that makes sense to me. Not 
necessarily on purpose. Right. I just think our guard is down. That makes sense to me. Where I was going with this, and I, I changed it three times. Y'all should have seen the first two times. But where I was going with this was I wonder if, if, if when he was in, in Potiphar's house, if, if he had let his guard down, would we have been reading a different story? That's, that's where I was going. I was trying to figure a way to word that. And like I said, I worded it three times. This was revision number three, and I left it alone. Um, but that's where I'm going. When, when we're kind of successful and everything's coming up fambled in, in everything in my life, do I tend to kind of let God's hand go and kind of forget spiritual things during that time? That is different than letting my guard down. You think that's different? Than letting my guard down. Okay. Wow. I said wow. I said wow. But I think that and letting your guard down are two different things. Okay. I can see that. Because if it was so easy to let something go that you really didn't have hold to. I can see that. It's going good for you. Then, uh, I mean, I, I equate this. I had a nephew who won the lottery. He won like $100 million. And he let the family go. Yeah. He wanted absolutely nothing to do with the family. My, my parents, which were his grands and his other grands, um, and he was very angry with my brother, his, his dad. And so he wanted absolutely nothing. Even though he had been depending on the family, my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters, um, and they would take care of his needs and they seem to have a relationship. As soon as he won that money, he let him go, which told me he really it was it was because I need you relationship, not because I want you. Yeah. And so, yeah. But what I heard recently was that he lost it all, but he still had to come back to pay. And I'm I'm going to end on this one. Don't they call that the curse of the lottery? I've heard that before. That people who win like big gobs of money. Shortly thereafter, I've heard this, that they kind of go broke is kind of what they call the curse of the lottery. Uh, again, going back to what we're talking about, and I'll close here, it, you know, if we're going to practice integrity, if we're going to be people of God, if we're going to be Christians, it should not be circumstantial. It shouldn't be, well, I don't have anything, so I'm close to God, or I got a bunch. It should be even keel all the while, no matter what. Our life ought to always be lived in allegiance to God no matter what our circumstance and like Jerry indicated and I agree with this we ought to let those circumstances serve as building blocks to get me closer and closer to God not as ankle shackles for the past but looking to the future and say okay Lord that one didn't work out so good um, how can we turn this around I can be better I can be better for you I'll finish these uh, next week because I want to talk about uh, Joseph's time in prison and he's actually going to meet three people that are going to promise him some things if you ever get out um, two actually and I want to I want to finish with that a little bit before we finish with Joseph and then move forward but I'm already two minutes uh, over time any other questions comments let's be dismissed I'll finish Joseph uh, next week let's be dismissed